The story literally, you know, jumped in front of my face. It wasn't really the story, it was more so Ariel. I met her doing another project and I was doing deep research in the Diamond District and I came across her and she happened to have been apprenticing there and I, her two weeks overlapped somehow with my two, the, the tail end of my two and a half years. And I, and I met her and I had no idea what her situation was. I had no idea that she was a homeless, yeah. addicted junkie with this crazy boyfriend. And I just kind of became her friend. And the closer we became friends, the more and more I got inspired as I do by my friends. And then I started to commission her writings and, and, and direct them. The best thing you actually said once was that it was the end of the work day and everybody was leaving and everybody's usually rushing through the turnstiles, but she was just kind of like very relaxed. Just like trying to get her car, it wasn't working, but she was just trying to get it through. And you're like, oh, that's strange. She has a gun. The Metro card she is actually using is the card that the Methadone Clinic gives you. They give you a two ride per day card, and a lot of a lot of people at the Methadone Clinic sell them. You know, for at the half they go down to the subway and they sell their two ride Metro cards for one ride of cash, and then they go and then they buy like a Xanax bar out of it. And so it's her personal story. Right? Why did you decide to have her play her own role? Well, it's her. You just said it. It's yeah. her personal story. Movie, I mean, the, the, that, I'm not interested. Yeah. Movie. Listen. The only reason people are even attracted to movie stars, like right now, if if, if Benny was Tom Cruise and I was Brad Pitt, you know what we would be. It, it, you there would be a different vibe in this room. Everybody would kind of be on edge, and everyone would want to like whatever they, whatever comes with celebrity but there's something that starts that you know those stars have to start at some point and there's something that makes somebody have a gravitational pull like that that's why they're called stars and I didn't it wasn't even her story that made me want to make this movie it was her stardom that made me want to make the movie so it wasn't like oh here's this crazy story who are we gonna cast It's like here's this incredible person who's such a movie star and what kind of movie can we make with her? Oh, her story is 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 incredible, and we wanted to make this fusion yeah, of kind of this reality and fiction. That's it. Is that it, the movie wouldn't well, that's exist? Not it. It, no, 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 the movie wouldn't exist without the with her without her playing her part. Like that psychological well, that process. To even was acknowledge that decision though is is untrue. It was not a movie. It was of only course. a movie because of her. Yeah. So like to imply that there was a decision is 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 not even. It's just irrelevant. Well, our, our producer, he would, he would once in a while, he'd be like, you know what, we could recast this role. I'm like, no, that's impossible. Well, he would say that to her. To <laughs> yeah, kind of like, that's impossible. You know, that's, the two right. things are inseparable. And as far as, as the cast goes, aside from Caleb and Jones, how did you get the other people out? Of, out of Neck, well, originally, uh, originally, Edward Furlong was playing the Scully character. <laughs> uh, and then something happened, and like literally like two days before, we had to re we had to figure something out. And Necro is a rapper who I've known about since I was 17, and he did a, he has an incredible video, music video called I Need Drugs. And when it came out, it was very hard to get your hands on. When you did get your hands on it, you kind of felt like you had to wash them afterwards because it has this real vibe. I mean, it's a great because it's it approaches the video, and I suggest everybody go out and watch this video. It's called I Need Drugs. I mean, if you have, it's a cult video, so I'm sure you've already seen it. But in the video, he's singing. I need a, a rap song. He's big. He's like an underground rapper. He invented gore rap, and he's singing uh, "I Need Drugs" to the tune of LL Cool J's "I Need Love," and it's about his uncle, who's a legendary junkie in New York, named Uncle Howie. And it's the video is him at Uncle Howie's apartment, while Uncle Howie's like banging dope and like smoking crack. And it's just, but there's a lightness to the video because it's his uncle and there's such a knowing relationship there. So it's like, he's just there and it's like, when you watch you're like, wow, this is crazy. Is this guy just like mocking this man? But like, I mean, you don't feel that. You just know like this is, they're, they're related. So whatever, Elaine or Hendrix, who was active in our film, was one of the other professional actors who played Erica. She was the one who suggested, she was also a casting director, she said, I think we should get Necro to play Scully because the real Scully was obsessed with Necro. And we were like, how are we gonna get in touch with Necro? It's not like a Hollywood actor where you could just pick up the phone and call their agent. It's, he's Necro, you know, he's like, you know, yes, he has a website, and you can just write the email, but like, he's not gonna answer. He gets thousands of emails from crazy fans all day. So we went through our friend, a rapper friend from Queens, this guy Despot, and he linked us up. And, and then uh, some of the other characters, you know, some of them were from Ariel's world, and other ones we we went. They went through like you know somewhat of an audition process.
was, when I say audition, it's not like they came in look, red lines. It's, the, it's perfect example is with Necro. We weren't. He wasn't getting. He was recording an album. You know, where he's producing somebody's album. So we were going to shoot a scene with with that character, but we couldn't get in touch with him. So we had cast somebody else, and we were shooting the scene, and it just wasn't. It wasn't working. And he actually showed up in the middle of shooting that scene. It was almost like. Well, he was vague <laughs> about it. He said he wanted to do it, but he was producing this album, so he wasn't sure he was going to be able to. Yes, so he cast someone else, and then he surprised us by showing he up. He showed on up set. on set, but like after we had shot half the day, and we just kind of just switched. It wasn't gears. half the day; it was just an hour. No, it was half. The, it was much later than an hour. We were we were, it was like one o'clock. He showed up at two o'clock. We were shooting it by nine o'clock in the morning. It's half the day. But what we didn't shoot at those scenes with. We shot a lot of scenes with this other actor. Uh, you don't remember? We shot, no, we shot a lot, of, a lot of it. Was a lot of different takes though. We had already done a full. Scene, the just scene one. was almost fully covered, whether he realizes it or not. I have one there last was... question. One last question. Um, when you guys do your movies, when you make your films, do you guys have like a certain goal? Is it you guys want to tell a story? Is how, how does that process work? We want to make the greatest film ever made. That's the goal, and <laughs> and uh, each time. You think that you achieve it, and every filmmaker thinks that the greatest. There's this amazing cop cartoon from Mad Magazine where it's like one strip is that Ronnie, our co-writer, shows me all the time, just to remind me. One strip is they're on set, and there's these actors, and they're telling a joke, but you don't know what the the the, the crew and everyone find it to be unbearably hilarious. Like if people are crying, it's so funny. And then the next panel is that same scene shown in a movie theater, and it's just a bunch of people like sitting in the theater like completely unamused by it. And that disposition is really like, you know, you try to match, you try to take your enthusiasm that you have and from every level, from getting an actor to be in your movie to getting an audience member feel what you want them to feel. And, uh, you know, the, the level of success is, is matched when those kind of levels meet. And you realize, oh, okay, our level of enthusiasm is matching the audience's level of enthusiasm. And the vibe that we wanted to put out there is the vibe that's felt and lingers. And this movie still sticks with me. So the fact that people come up to me and say, you know, like, I saw this movie six months ago and I still think about it. It still haunts me in my sleep. That's a level of success. And I think that's when you've made a great film. And I, I don't think, I, I'm not, you know, I think that we made a great movie. So, I'm, you know, I, that's the goal is to make a great movie, not good movie.